welcome back. And of course, as was mentioned earlier in the show, uh, based on the recent outbreak of hepatitis A in the Cayo district, uh, where 20 students, a little over 20 students, have confirmed that they do have hepatitis, we've invited Dr. Fernando Cuellar here to explain to us a bit what hepatitis A is and how it's contracted. So good morning and welcome. Morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me once again. I'm always glad to come and share some information. Right. Now, when we hear hepatitis, uh, it can be several different types of hepatitis. Mm -hmm. uh, so can we start off with just what that is and the classifications? Yeah, I think indeed the understanding of the word hepatitis needs to come across um, thoroughly. The word hepatitis means inflammation of the liver. That's what it means. Yeah. Okay. The causes are different. As a matter of fact, in medicine, when you want to say inflammation of a certain part of your body, you add the itis at the end. The, is it the suffix? I think that's what we mm -hmm. say in grammar. Um, so you have conjunctivitis, we have hepatitis, we have carditis, we have dermatitis, yeah. we have all of the itises. No? So that just tells us the anatomical location and that there's an inflammatory process attached to it. Sorry, I just know William is going to use itis now after everything. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> He's smiling already. Mamitis, mamitis, mamitis. Okay. Um, so that's just what that word means. Though there are different causes. Mm -hmm. There are causes uh, by viruses, which is the one that we are facing. Uh, medication sometimes causes it. Uh, bacteria sometimes could cause uh, hepatitis. Um, toxins, chemicals. Uh, we have autoimmune diseases, so we have a whole realm, a whole group, a whole lot of things that can cause hepatitis. But the ones that we are interested in for today is the one that is caused by the viruses called the viral um, type hepatitis. Okay? Uh, we have five of them. They come in the alphabetical yeah. order A, B, C, D, E. The first three are the ones that are most known to us, the A, the B, the C. The A is the one that we're, is, is found in contaminated food or water. It's a food born or a water born or a fecal born, they say sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, the B is the one that is transmitted sexually uh, through sexual intercourse. And the C is the one that you usually get through uh, blood transfusion, through contaminated needles, through the IV route. Yeah. So the hepatitis A is indeed present in our community. We see it. Mm -hmm. um, Pretty you much saying, once or yeah. twice a year, even in the city. That's what you were explaining to us before. It's not that you never see hepatitis A. You do see it. We do see it. Um, just not very often. Exactly. And the numbers is what would cause a bit of alarm. Mm -hmm. Once it surpasses, once it go over the, the actual baseline number for the air. Mm -hmm. But um, we do see mild cases. We do see severe cases year round, even in our urban setting, even in the city. No? Now, when you have an outbreak in a particular area, Area, is it important that they get to the root cause of it? Yeah, definitely, William. Excellent question. The, the fancy word they use there is the, the index case, okay, which is the original case, the one that was identified to be the first case. And because of that, they can trace how the contamination, the transmission, and infection went. Okay, but it's always important to try to identify the first, the first case because then you can figure a little bit better where the source came from. Is it from a drinking water supply? Is it from improperly cooked food? To try to so that you can get to the to the root of the problem, basically. Mm -hmm. Now. Is it something that uh, is contagious? It's, it's contagious, but through the, what they call a fecal oral route, meaning that they have to be on sanitary conditions, people not washing their hands properly, food not being properly prepared, um, water contaminated. It has to come, it, it doesn't come airborne, for example. You hear about Ebola and all the other viruses. This one you have to actually the eat to do. Okay, mm. in find <laughs> quantities or to drink it so that you could get it. No, it's or bad it's hygiene. That's what it hygiene. is. So you touch something and then eat, eat. and touch your exactly. mouth. Exactly. Um, where somebody which didn't we all do. I mean, sometimes you know, in in this reality of life, yeah. we do remember many times, if not ninety eight percent of the time, to wash our hands. But sometimes yeah. we're handed thing and we put it in our mouth, and there we yeah. go. 
and we don't sometimes wash our hands properly. Some exactly. people just use water, some people don't use soap, some people don't scrub. There's enough data on that one. But how does hepatitis affect the liver? It causes inflammation of the liver cells. Uh -huh. It causes destruction of the liver cells. In the liver cells, you have a, a pigment called bilirubin, which mm -hmm. would, when it's destroying these liver cells, it would make this uh, pigment, this, this color, this thing gets liberated into your bloodstream, and that is why, for example, um, jaundice appears. The famous word, I, I hear yeah. it a lot. Uh, people know, don't know that they had hepatitis, they know they had jaundice when they were um, a child. Not jaundice is, is, is the yellowness of the eyes or the skin. So that's what jaundice means. Jaundice also can be caused by the other things, but hepatitis is a common, common reason common people reason. get jaundice. Now, what would trigger someone to actually go and get tested for hepatitis A? They start feeling unwell. They start feeling sick. One of the main things it does, it gives you a lot of fatigue, uh, tiredness. The other thing is that it gives you a little bit of nausea, make you feel bad, want to vomit. The same jaundice, it could give you a bit of fever, a bit of diarrhea. So a bit of tenderness, a little bit of pain in the, in the abdominal area, especially under the right, right rib cage, that's where your liver is. Mm -hmm. So people will start complaining a little bit of a discomfort around there. But the, the, the fatigue, the fever, they feel mm -hmm. bad, those are the things that would... As a matter of fact, that brings you to the point that many people have hepatitis and especially in children they have hepatitis or they, they get infected and not even realize it mm -hmm. okay because sometimes it comes in a very mild form oh the only bad belly you have the only whatever you can eat something yeah. something and indeed it was hepatitis so the question then is it life-threatening in a very small amount of cases William very small amount of cases I would say I think it's less than 5% of the case that hepatitis can cause so much damage to the liver that it makes the liver function deteriorate and, and fails and then we're in trouble. Is the damage permanent that takes place? That's a good question too. Thankfully the more common form of hepatitis, the hepatitis A that we're facing right now is the least damaging to the liver. Mm -hmm. It's the most common, but it is least damaging. The hepatitis B and the hepatitis C are the one that leaves more permanent damage. The gas, cirrhosis of the liver, cancer of the liver. So thankfully the hepatitis here, you get it, and chances are that you can get over it big time. So essentially the transmission takes place when this virus is somehow ingested? Yes, yes. Okay. That's how you get contaminated, no? Okay. Either through water that's not, um, it's not sanitary or food that's not properly prepared or you that are not, that is not practicing good hygiene. No? Mm -hmm. and Go now it, it's very interesting because um, <clears throat> When do you encourage somebody to actually go and seek? Because this is one of the um, common uh, illnesses, I, I guess I can, uh, when people have a bad belly mm -hmm. and they give you a cup of water, they do all kinds of things, it's not so something that triggers yeah. Yeah. immediately that you go to a doctor. Yeah. I would, that's also a good question, because that's, that's what we face on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, Doc, I've been feeling bad from last week, and I'm still not. I think a 72-hour period is a, is a reasonable, wise amount of time. So you know what, if I'm not feeling better in 72 hours, which is in three days, then I better go get that checked, okay? And we also, as caregivers, sometimes slip down and don't think about hepatitis as one of the more, more possibilities, no? Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes we get some little telltale signs that it'll join this little bit of tenderness in the belly or the pain in the right rib cage area. And then we would ask for a test to see if there's any, any trouble with the liver. When we see trouble with the liver, then we go and ask for the different um, testing of the specific type of hepatitis. And thankfully now, we have the test them that can tell you if it was hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Mm -hmm. Now the larger picture here is looking at uh, foodborne illnesses mm -hmm. that seems to be very common in Belize. I think there was a study done last year or the year before with gastroenteritis right. and looking at some of the common causes. And it really is showing that people are either not preparing food properly or having hygienic uh, practices in food preparation or even washing their hands. Right. Uh, let's, let's, let's look at that issue specifically. Um, clearly, there's, there's room for, for big improvement when it comes to that and, and more, more um, discussion, more information sharing, uh, going to the schools, 
emphasizing that the children need to learn to wash their hands before they eat, make sure that our, I think our water supply generally is safe though, as compared to other countries. Um, and the, the, the cultural practices we have sometimes, especially in a rural area, where things are not fully cooked and that kind of thing. I mean, those are the things that need to be addressed. Yeah. I think we, we are much better off than other developing countries overall. Yeah. Um, and I think our Ministry of Health does well in, in that kind of, of um, primary care kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Another good point to bring up is there is a vaccination against hepatitis A, mm -hmm. right? So um, you can include that in your scheme of, of, of immunization. Yeah. It's not commonly done. I think it's done mostly for persons like us who are in the healthcare who are more um, or I think it would even make sense to give people who are involved with food preparation so that um, they yeah, don't run the risk of, of passing, passing at all. No? Now, when you come to rural areas, because that's often one of the concerns where you may not have uh, closed plumbing, mm -hmm. so to speak, and there's a latrine of some sort, is that an does that increase the risk? Yeah, that is conducive to, 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 to not only hepatitis but other type of infection being transmitted. As a matter of fact, latrines should be built a certain way so that it and minimizes distance. and there's a whole science behind a latrine and, and I'm sure that um, lots of areas, the rural areas have running water that is safe but if there's water obtained from maybe vats or well, there's also tech, I mean, different things that you can do to to ensure that the, the supplies. And I don't think anybody can be that poor or that uneducated not to understand that they need to wash their hands. No? And we don't need no fancy soap, no? just one regular whatever soap <laughs> to wash your hands and, and learn to wash a good marlin touch. And sometimes we think we are washing our hands properly, but there's also a technique, mm -hmm. a proper technique to wash your hands. Mm -hmm. No. How many times have you washed your hands? Sir? <laughs> I washed my hands a lot. <laughs> no, it's, it's fascinating because I remember doing a story on this exact same mm -hmm. issue that statistics show that yeah. people don't wash their hands. And actually men don't wash their hands as much as women. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we're all very lacking in the yeah, area. Don't be surprised because even us in, in the hospital and medical, we have had to um, create a, a awareness for, for doctors, for nurses, for everybody to be washing hands. Thankfully now there are these hand sanitizers yeah. that are so convenient so that we can quickly, we have kind of instituted um, some dispensing thing in each room and we hope that ourselves, the patient, the patient family um, become involved and that is very helpful yeah. to reduce the, the transmission of infections. How, how much of a threat is this uh, to public health? Because very often when you have conversations like this, uh, people see it as an alarm, sounding an alarm, but if they feel like, oh, you can get away with it because it's not that serious, they may not uh, pay attention. Why would you encourage people to uh, listen to the alarm being sounded at this point? Well, for one, it's a sickness. It'll make you feel bad. It'll make you lose days of school, days mm -hmm. of work. So that's a consideration. And the other thing is that although the percentage of people dying from hepatitis A is small, you never know if you'll be that, that person. Yeah? We recently had, I think, we, we were faced maybe about six months ago with a very, very serious case of hepatitis B right from the city here that worried us for at least a couple of weeks because the person actually went in to live a failure. Hmm. And um, luckily she recovered, or she has recovered. Um, but it was scary at and worrisome at, at a point, no? Hmm. And somebody who you never think would, <laughs> would come across hepatitis yeah. type A. Hmm. What is... Um what is your advice to the parents and the family, especially of the affected area, um, in terms of uh, containing this yeah. particular outbreak? Well, I, I always um, I'm think that I can always commend the Ministry of Health for yeah. doing a good job all the time when it comes to primary care. I mean, we could quarrel about other things, but primary mm -hmm. care, it's, it seems to be their forte. And they, I'm sure that they are top of things there. They know how yeah. to do their stuff, listen to them. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how much access to other type of information exists in these rural areas, listen to the radio, I don't know if internet is there, but the basic thing is to wash your hands, practice safe uh, sanitation, See. and listen to the health authorities, because I'm sure that they are already in there, and I'm pretty much confident that it won't get more yeah. out of hand, no? 
One of the things when you have an invasion of any sort, um, one question that comes to mind for me is, is it ever then out of your system um, after you've been cured? Because that's a good question, William. Yes, you get over this disease completely, and beneficially, you develop an immunity. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's highly unlikely that you will get hepatitis A again um, a second get time. Other forms you of can get hepatitis. the B, C, D, or E, but um, it, it provides, once you get, um, as a matter of fact, the thought is that children uh, come across the hepatitis A virus, they have very mild forms that the parents would call bad belly and so forth. They develop the immunity and they don't ever have hepatitis A for the rest of their lives. Huh? So it generates a lot of, of, of defense mm -hmm. um, for later years. You mentioned earlier a 72 hour window of uh, uh, perhaps mm, dealing with your symptoms of diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting at home. Is it the same with young children or should you be more careful? I think the smaller the child, more careful. Maybe we could put that door back another uh, 24 hours. So if in 48 hours, two days, you're mm -hmm. picking it up, they get better. Um, still a vomit, still no feel, still fussy, then take him to the nearest healthcare center or, or access the. And since these are, are young people, children who have been infected, how do, uh, does the family handle it? You know, um, one of the things that we saw on a previous slide was the whole idea of um, even spoons and yeah. cups and everything else. Yeah. How do you handle it within your family structure to make sure that it doesn't become um, something that I think it would be a wise thing to kind of semi-isolate somebody. Don't meaning that you are lock them up in a room and put the food under the door and, yeah. keep <laughs> and that kind of thing. But they can use their own sets of utensils. Um, they can use the bathroom like commonly with everybody else. Just make sure everybody they wash their hands. Even the person who uses the bathroom wash their hands after they use the bathroom. Um, but that would be the approach. No, just s highlight the whole um, sanitation part. No, you don't have to lock them up in the room and. Uh, don't let them come out for the rest of their lives or the, within the next month. But and how long would that in in It uh, depends, but I would say about two to three weeks. You mm -hmm. would think that it's then safe. I'm sure that that person will be monitored and, and checked frequently and blood tests done to make sure that they're getting over this yeah. hepatitis case. No? Mm -hmm. So what's the final message at this point? Um, don't forget to wash your hands. Um, it helps a lot, it saves a lot of lives, it saves a lot of money because <laughs> you know these things can become costly mm -hmm. and it doesn't just apply to hepatitis, no? yeah. just everything. Yeah. Huh? All right. Well, we want to thank you Dr. Cuellar for joining us this morning. And um, Always a pleasure William. <laughs> same here. We're going to go ahead and take a break and when we come back it will be for a wrap for today. Don't go anywhere. Open your eyes and food after these messages.